month this morning. Okay, over to you, Dr. Weeks. Tell us a little All bit right. about yourself. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me here. I'm uh, Bill Weeks, and as Rachel pointed out, I did uh, work at Dartmouth Medical School for some time. Uh, uh, I, I'm an addiction psychiatrist by training, went to med school at University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, and then up to Dartmouth where I did residency training and just stuck there for about 20 something years where I taught in MPH courses. I don't know which course you, did you take the uh, financial management course or the critical issues course? Or? I think you were uh, just a lecturer in our uh, first two years. I uh, came oh, through a few oh, times in, med in medical okay, school. Yeah, I gave a yeah. course on uh, like uh, uh, health economics or something like that. Just a one shot deal. So, okay. Fabulous. Think, plan, um, act, do. That's I learned that from you. <laughs> yeah, and, and quality improvement stuff. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so I was there for some time, did mostly health services research. Uh, and then uh, picked up an MBA and a PhD in economics along the way and came to Microsoft about two and a half uh, years ago, uh, where I've continued to do the kind of research that I love to do, which is this kind of health services research that we'll go over some of. And you guys, you guys got kind of a summary sent to you uh, of some of the stuff we've been doing over the past few years there. Um, I, uh, I uh, two months ago moved to Paris to run a project for Microsoft here. So it's the uh, late afternoon for me here and I'm sitting on my house uh, right on the Seine, my, my apartment right overlooking the Seine. I can look up, I'm about uh, three blocks from the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay and I can see the very tip of the Eiffel Tower from my place. So it's a great place uh, to be. So I will start, let's see, sharing my screen here and we can get into the, talk and just feel free to interrupt if uh, I mean it's a small group so if you have questions or something's not clear feel free to just chime in um, so and hopefully you guys are seeing this yeah uh, so uh, someone brought up the idea that social determinants uh, matter right in healthcare and this has been kind of a big thing uh, that's been highlighted recently, but it's been known for quite some time. Uh, you know, Marmot did a study in the 50s, in 60s, that found out that, you know, if you're, you're um, the type of job that you had and your income in, as a British civil servant, all of which were pretty good jobs, had uh, dramatic associations with your uh, health outcomes, particularly your mortality rate, and even correcting for stuff like whether you smoked and whether you had prior heart disease and things like that. Um, and so, so that work, uh, uh, you know, blossomed all this additional investigation into other things beyond just healthcare that uh, impact health and caused uh, Evans and Stoddard, for instance, up in Canada to create the field model of health, which shows all these different things that you're seeing here uh, on, this, uh, on this slide. And, and how they're all interrelated to kind of impact health. And, and these, you know, and the intriguing thing is the studies show that maybe between 20 and 30% of your health, right, your overall health is impact, it, it, you know, is directly associated with healthcare. So healthcare has an impact, but it's not a majority impact uh, at all. The other big ones here are health behaviors, you know, the, the risks that you take and the way that you live your life, the physical environment in which you live, and then the biggest component is kind of socioeconomics stuff. And that's what I've kind of focused on uh, for the last several years. Um, most of this is this point out here is back to your zip code. So at Dartmouth, we had a, a saying that uh, geography is destiny and where you live uh, depend, uh, kind of determine the, the type and the quality and the amount of health care that you get. Um, what we didn't know back then as much is that socioeconomic factors kind of define the zip codes. And that's probably driving a lot of that uh, variation that we saw in the healthcare utilization uh, in the bottom part of this slide. Let's see here. Uh, so what we've found in the studies, and again, you've got the papers that go much more into this. This is just a couple of studies. It um, is that there's low value care when people live in high economic distress areas. So high economic distress is, also kind of a low prosperity level uh, uh, area. Uh, the, to determine this at the zip code level, we use information from the Economic Innovation Group, which uses data from the census and the American Community Survey 
to assign to each of 25,000 zip codes across the US um, the economic distress, with zero being low economic distress and 100 being high economic distress. And so we could uh, group these into quintiles. So, you know, the bottom 20%, middle, or second, third, fourth, and highest 20% uh, of economic stress and do analyses of outcomes using uh, Medicare, largely uh, Medicare fee-for-service data. <clears throat> and here, if we think about what value is, it's uh, really the equation of uh, quality divided by cost, right? Which is, uh, if we get to the triple aim or the quadruple aim, Quality has several additional metrics that might include the patient experience, the provider experience, and then kind of the quality of care and the health outcomes. All of that divided by cost, that is value, and that's what healthcare is trying to create. And in these, uh, in the fee for service, service Medicare population, what we find is that as the economic distress levels increase, so that going from the lowest at black to the highest in white, the percentage of the population that gets flu shots de decreases, the percentage of the population that gets annual wellness visits decreases, the percentage of the population that gets transitional care management decreases. All of these are recommended Medicare services that are paid for indeed, right? So it's not a question of not having money and not being able to afford, they're, they're free to the patient, they're paid for for the providers, and yet you see a, a decrease in their utilization as you go from uh, low to high economic stress. And you do see that the patients actually have slightly higher uh, risk scores, suggesting that they have a higher illness burden. So they are probably in most need of these three types of services, right? So, um, so you know, against need, we're, we're failing on that. And the, uh, the other uh, challenge is that there's about a 15% higher cost of care per patient when in the highest uh, economic distress zones as compared to the lowest ones. So, um, so, we're, so this is the definition of low value, right? Where the quality is low and the cost is high. It's the antithesis of what we want to achieve. And that is uh, you know, a problem in America. And this, this, uh, these high costs uh, are, are frequently due to things that could be avoided. So uh, for the providers in the group, you know that, um, ambulatory care sense of conditions uh, and admission for those can largely be avoided if you have good primary care uh, in the community. When you don't have that, your CHF gets out of control, your um, asthma gets out of your control, your diabetes gets out of control, you go to the ER and you get admitted and you have a very expensive stay for something that could have been prevented at a much lower cost uh, earlier. And, and of course, uh, it, all those who work in healthcare also know that you know, the hospital is a really kind of dangerous place to be in, right? Not only are there medical errors that can kill you, but there's really bad bacteria. Um, and and it's, it's not a pleasant experience for patients. Patients are not clamoring to get in to, to be admitted for things like pneumonia and CHF exacerbations. Uh, the other thing that we found looking at these data, and again, this is for Medicare fee for service population, is that uh, mortality per the, the age, sex, race adjusted mortality rates um, are different when you look at areas that had high levels of economic distress and stayed there, or had low levels and stayed there, or changed uh, during a 12 year time period. So at the top line, you see that, um, that uh, Mortality rates went, they, they did decrease over a 12 year period. The uh, age sex race adjusted mortality rates decreased from about 5.8% uh, to about 5.4%. Um, if you were in the solid line at the bottom there, that's a, that's a low economic distress areas. That's a low economic distress quintile. So they already had an advantage. They started at 5%, but they dropped faster. They dropped all the way to 4%. So you see that the gap is widening, even though there's improvement on both, uh, including the high economic stress areas, the gap is widened. Um, and further, what you see is that where there's been change in the uh, economic distress, where the economic stress started low, so it was a high a, a prosperous era area that got worse, you see a flattening, that's the small dotted line, 
you see a flattening of that curve. It's a, it's more at the rate, even a worse rate than the um, high economic distress area. And where it started at a high economic distress level and got better, you see that that very much mimics the um, the, the started low and remain low. Uh, and so you, you, there was this gap that widened as a result of changing economic conditions locally. Went from an equivalent at 2003 to you know about 0.6 percent mortality rate change. And this is, you know, it, you might think, oh, it's a percentage change, it's a percentage difference. This is for you know Medicare fee for service people who are 65 and older, and a, a drop of a one percent from six you know to five is a pretty substantial change in uh in you know 12 years it's, it's kind of astounding actually uh i'm not the only one that studies this this was a paper that actually i wrote a editorial on that came out earlier this spring uh, that did very similar kind of thing they looked at changes in economic prosperity and they looked at cardiovascular and uh, all-cause mortality and what they found over a shorter time period is that uh, all cause mortality for the, and, and the way that they did this is they said that they, the, the highest tercile meant that they, uh, that they, they were high, th th their economic change was in an improvement and it was the highest third. So they just ranked everyone. How did you change? How was your economic prosperity at the county level different when from 2010 to 2017? And the highest one um, had the lowest had the highest amount of change, so the biggest improvement, and the lowest tercile, the blue, had the lowest uh, amount of change, so the, the worst improvement or probably even declines, right? And for the highest tercile, it was just pretty much flat. It started lower uh, than the lowest tercile, and it remained flat, and we see the same kind of widening, though, that the lowest tercile, the ones that had the biggest drop in economic prosperity, uh, had higher rates of death over time uh, going from 2010 to 2017. And you can, I would refer you to the paper there. Uh, it's tougher to see on this graphic because they put it all uh, in the same uh, graph with the same, uh, you know, y-axis. But that, that held for all the cardiovascular diseases as well. You saw the exact same kind of pattern. <clears throat> and so, so if we think about that, there's this possibility that uh, local economic change can generate and be associated with eventual improved health outcomes, independent of other things. We could think of a return on investment kind of a concept. And generally, when you think of a return on investment, you think of an investment money going out of your pocket. So it, this is like if you put money in the stock market, or if you buy a house, you, you pay, right? That's the red. And then over time, you get returns on that investment, whether it's a house that you rent or you resell the house later, or you have tax benefits from having the house or uh, the, the market you know, gives you uh, dividends and, and, uh, and the stock price improves, right? So when you can actually bring all that back and create what's called a net present value of the investment. And, and look at that, uh, how that value accumulates for you for a particular asset over time. Um, what what uh, people who invest in healthcare technology and in healthcare improvement wonder about, because it's the same kind of thing. If you invest in technology, if you buy an electronic medical record, or you even do a quality improvement project, you're taking people's time, you're investing it, and you want to have some level of return, right? Uh, the return might be that you uh, improve your links of stay, you provide better care, your quality, you know, the, the numerator of the value equation improves. But the challenge is to think about what's the magnitude of those changes, what's the timing of those changes, who are the beneficiaries of those changes, and what are the types of, benefit, uh, of benefits that accrue to the beneficiaries. Um, so the magnitude is just the size, when does it happen? The beneficiaries could be uh, any kind of uh, participant in the uh, health ecosystem. So it could be that the insurer wins, right? Because they're not paying for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. The providers might win because uh, they, their quality scores go up and they get, they get better payments or something like that. Uh, the patients might win because they avoid admissions and they live longer and stuff like that. But there are other, beyond those health outcomes at the bottom, there are other types of 
returns that might accrue by local economic investment, including the economic growth, extension of the buying cycle. So if you just think of very pragmatically here, if, if, a, if patients live longer, right, they're actually able to buy more stuff longer too. And so, so third parties who are retailers, whether it's CVS or Microsoft or, uh, or you know, the local shopping uh, market might be interested in extending the buying cycle of an individual over time. There might be more political stability and uh, happiness if people have better health outcomes. Um, economic uh, investment would, uh, could, could uh, obviously impact jobs and jobs impact health uh, insurance. And that would be great. And obviously economic, uh, if, if there's economic investment, you have jobs uh, and, and the rents go up and the, the value of the housing goes up, the tax revenues tend to go up as well. So there's a variety of types of different returns on investment that could be um, accessed by any of the players in the healthcare ecosystem or the general ecosystem. And, and one could imagine even that these healthcare ecosystem members might, might the timing and the magnitude of the returns for them might vary depending on what the investment is. So uh, uh, to, as I mentioned, we wrote this uh, uh, editorial on the cardiovascular mortality paper where we just kind of tried to articulate that there are, uh, when you're investing in healthcare technologies and uh, or trying to improve cardiovascular care, uh, that may have certain outcomes, but when you're investing in the community in general, you might have different health outcomes that just as I've shown by my own work and by their work uh, accrue to the society and to, to, to potential uh, investors in that change in economic prosperity. And if you just have that kind of thinking, it might cause uh, policymakers and investors to consider the health impact of investment decisions. Uh, it might support long-term study of the impact of investment on healthcare quality and outcomes. It might be used by investors to capture kind of externalities associated with the investment um, and be used as a rationale for generating common ground for investment coalitions. So uh, those of you who work in healthcare are familiar with the uh, community benefits requirements that are required of not-for-profit uh, healthcare organizations. Every year they to maintain their not-for-profit status in their tax returns, they have to say, these are the community benefits that have, we've generated by virtue of uh, providing education and free healthcare and different things like that. You can imagine a similar kind of a thing happening with the coalition of investors. And part one of those, one of those community benefits might be improved healthcare. So if you have a, a, uh, a group of investors that's coming together uh, in, a, in an economic zone that is impoverished or is under a lot of economic distress, and they invest in a plant there. And the plant then generates um, jobs and employs people. You, you could then imagine that their community benefits might be improvement in the housing value and the housing stock, uh, improvement in tax revenues, improvement uh, in green space and other things that might go along with their building of the plant when they, when they invest in the plant, but also in the general health benefits of the uh, community. And in, in my, view that that then creates incentives for them to invest and for coalitions to come together and find this common ground so that you might intriguingly find, uh, you know, Boeing investing in a plant and having um, St. Joe's uh, also investing with them because they will get the health benefit or Primera because they will get the health benefit that's generated from the plant, from the jobs and the economic activity that the jobs and uh, the investment uh, produces. So that is the talk and I'll switch back away if I can from stop sharing and uh, would love to hear questions or chat or whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Weeks. That was that was fascinating. And I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments um, that the group will bring. I the question that comes to mind for me, so I, I shared a little bit of um, an overview of 
Cambia Grove's uh, advancement framework and the way that we think about driving transformation towards the triple aim and those three underlying ecosystem elements of infrastructure, incentives, and culture, and kind of working to optimize those. Um, I, I'd be curious, you know, obviously these these roundtables bring a lot of like-minded change makers to the table. We all want to make change. We want to do something. We want to help in this way. What would be your advice for what we in our various, you know, capacities could actually do to, to move the needle in this direction that you're suggesting? What's sort of the first step that any one of us could take? Uh, to me, it gets back to kind of common ground and coalitions, right? I think the challenge with a lot of in investment is that it's quite expensive and people are uncertain about outcomes. So if you can find these, these so-called economics, we call them externalities, right? Something that a, a benefit that accrues to someone else that is you're, you're paying for. So, uh, so like if, uh, you know, just the example of a, a plant, you know, a plant being a, a, you know, a large corporation investing in a plant, um, the housing stock goes up, the educational system improves generally because people are paying more taxes, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thing happens. Those are externalities that, the, you know, the, these companies know this, right, because they go to the governments to get uh, tax abatements to put in the plan because the, the governments understand that, right? But what's not clear to me is they're not including the health aspects of that. Right. And so there, too, so as we might have uh, these additional externalities um, that could be even augmented by things like put in your plant, but also we're going to require you to put in green space and we're going to require you to kind of do this, uh, you know, put this in a community that's under economic distress. So we don't we don't want it in a, a high end Seattle community. We want it in one where there's, uh, you know, there, there's more of a need for this. And so target the areas where there's more of a need, target the, an area actually that has worse health outcomes and see if you can have as a result of that externality, some kind of a, a again, an external community benefit. What is it that you could um, bring to bear for that community? In a different paper, one thing that we found was that you, you see this improvement in places that go from high economic distress to low economic distress, you see improvement in care quality and the types of care that they use, and they kind of begin to mimic the high quality or the, or the, uh, the high prosperity areas. If there's high prosperity and it goes to lower prosperity, they tend to stick. Their health outcomes and health patterns tend to stick. So I think there's a bit of a stickiness that happens. So uh, because these other guys, maybe from the, the documentation I just provided, um, they're, they're already just getting so much worse care. And in healthcare, there are ceiling and floor effects, right? So if I can get my, uh, you know, flu vaccination rate to 85%, that, that's maybe about as good as I'm going to get. If I can get it bumped up from 60 to 75, that's going to be a huge impact on that population, right? I can work really hard and get it bumped from 75 to 78, and that's going to be a very modest impact. So go where the places where where the need is. Uh, try to invest there strategically and look at these health outcomes, um, as well as all the other externalities that accrue uh, to this to society, uh, but just make sure you capture and count and measure the health outcomes so as to, in the future, encourage other people to do the same. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. Um, okay, so I would encourage everyone to start sharing, thinking of your questions as it looks like a, a couple of you already have. And I think maybe what I'd like to start with is um, Stephanie, you had a great question that you shared in the chat first here. Would you like to come off mute and, and pose it yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm concerned that what I see already in communities around the shortage of providers for Medicaid and Medicare, and let's just throw VHA in there just for fun. Um, and so I think that they're already getting a sub a level of care because the, the provider saturation is low. So, um, and now with the pandemic, so many people have lost their employer-based insurance. So I would just be curious about what thoughts you have around this and actions that you think would be critical. And it, here, I guess I would like you to also, if you could put in something about universal health care, I'd like to understand your view of that. Yeah, well, to me, that's the solution here, right? Universal health care and, and equal payment, because uh, that, what you're describing here is exactly what happens, right? People, Medicaid, just pays really poorly, right? Um, compared to other people, so they'll say I'll take Medicaid, but uh, you know the providers among us may know that 
you say, yeah, I'll take Medicaid, but it's going to be 5% of my practice. And, and so you get this essential rationing of Medicaid patients. Um, uh, and, and it's bad. They tend to be people in pretty high need, right? Um, so yeah, you know, standardization of pricing with universal health care would help that, uh, this particular issue uh, quite a bit. I, I think access is clearly part of the equation. I think, you know, I think we always have to ask ourselves access to what, right? Because the, you want access to high quality care, right? Uh, just access to bad care isn't really going to do the trick. And and I think is another externality of, of local investment. You know, doctors don't tend to want to practice, and 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 nurse practitioners and so forth don't want to tend to practice in uh, areas of low economic prosperity, right? If the if the local envir economic environment changes, you pull in people who might be willing to work there. So access to care may go up. Hopefully, access to high quality care may go up. And then, like you said, just addressing the the, the cost uh, constraints that are in, in, imparted by a Medicaid payment would be a helpful solution through universal health care. So I have to follow up on that question, though, because so everybody knows that universal health care is the answer. But how is Microsoft looking at that? How are other big corporations looking at that? Because currently the situation of payers in this country is so um, embedded that I find that to be really hard to try to move. So uh, tell me what you I think. think. You're, yeah, I think it's exceedingly hard to try to move. There are big, big lobbies that don't want it to move. Um, and uh, you know, so what we're doing is actually we have a, a health equity initiative that we're working on and we're trying to, you know, Microsoft has a fair amount of policy uh, influence just because it's such a gargantuan corporation, much more uh, influence than when I was a professor at a med school, even an Ivy League med school. It's really, I mean, things can change quickly. So I think uh, there's alignment. My sense is that, you know, as value-based care takes off, because CMMI, are, they're trying these new things. There's more and more value-based care. They're trying to push that so the quality goes up and so forth. Um, that those same uh, practices are being adopted by the private insurers who are moving more and more to becoming third-party administrator, administrators. I think they want to have some role. I, I think it would be very difficult for them just to say, we're shutting down shop. So there would need to be some uh, role for that. And even the Medicare kind of stuff, that they're trying is uh, based on, I mean, there's some uh, actuarial adjustment uh, to make things fair kind of for, for determining where the value is coming. So I think there could be a role for the uh, insurers where, but they don't, they don't take the risk as much. They're the third party administrator, which even like Microsoft, we have Primera is our, is our insurer, but they're a third party administrator. We are self, uh, self-insured as many large organizations are. So you could just imagine that kind of extending. It's just, they, they've been so embedded, it's so hard to change them. Um, uh, so I think it'll be gradual, but I think it's picking up. And, and again, the, the value-based stuff and just the sense, I think their own sense is that they have to change. They're not gonna last forever. They're becoming dinosaurs. So and that could be hopeful. At, at Dartmouth, we've been predicting uh, We've been predicting single payer uh, universal health care for about 20 years that we're just on the cusp of it and not quite yet. Yeah, that, that's great. And thank you. Great questions, Stephanie. I think you touched on something that then Jacqueline also mentioned in the chat, which is the role that the large employers can play in sort of moving yeah. things in that direction. Um, that's something that we've seen at Cambia Grove, I've, I've experienced it in my, you know, past lives working in value-based care, the power that these large purchasers really have to drive change and kind of move that conversation forward. I'd, I'd, I'd be curious, Jacqueline, if you had anything else to add to your question that you'd like to share or? Sure. I think you really already spoke to what I was asking about, but, you know, in listening to you speak, Bill, I really see that kind of that larger impact that you're looking for, for the, um, the overall change really does need to happen from these thought leaders like at Microsoft. But I do think that often um, these larger corporations, if they see something that needs to happen, everybody kind of follows their lead. Yes. And so, um, you know, for that larger impact, I, I just wondered if you wanted to maybe build on that a little bit about how, you know, you've been predicting for 20 years that that we'd have a, um, you know, a common healthcare system. And, you know, I'd love to see that as 
somebody who sees some inequity in healthcare delivery and how and it's clearly just not fair that some portion of the population gets access to really good doctors. And if you just happen to have the poor luck to have a condition and you need Medicaid, too bad, it sucks to be you. And that's yeah. a terrible feeling. And so uh, anyway, um, building on that larger, th um, maybe corporate leadership would be a great, great uh, conversation to continue to have. Yeah. And, and, you know, so there are a bunch of corporations. Microsoft is not part of the leapfrog group, but I'm sure you've heard of the leapfrog group, which kind of sets standards for how, uh, you know, how to get address safety in patient care and said, we're not going to, I mean, kind of put through up uh, for insurers to say, say, you've got to do this and providers, you've got to do this. For instance, you have minimum volumes for cardiac surgery, right? Um, they just introduced minimum volumes, minimum annual volumes for providers for hip and knee replacement surgery because of this volume outcomes relationship. And Microsoft, we're kind of interested in, in using technology, using uh, Bing, for instance, technology to, uh, when they look up a doctor, to look at the relative volumes of particular procedures that they do because there is this volume outcomes relationship. So providing, you know, uh, information, uh, unbiased, fair information to patients uh, who can make decisions like around elective surgeries um, and, and continuing to push kind of the importance of having good uh, health care, supporting, you know, kind of universal health care coverage. Uh, you know, Microsoft gets in a tough spot, but we work with CMS. That's one of our clients. Um, and, uh, and we also work with a bunch of insurers. So, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a delicate tight rope balance. But, but I think to just kind of con continue to talk about this, I, when, I, when I give talks in front of the insurers, they seem to kind of know, like I say, that this is, they're figuring out a glide path for them to be relevant to actually to probably do the kind of work that we've just been discussing, where they're thinking about the social determinants, thinking about how to how do we invest? How do we manage patient populations to get the best population health? And that could be kind of a spinoff and very relevant, important uh, aspect of care for them to provide uh, in a universal um, uh, system. But I think I think you see a lot the healthcare uh, what's it called the business health business roundtable or something like that. There's quite a few different coalitions across the country. Um, and and uh, when at Dartmouth and even more recently, we tried to think about how we could bring together uh, groups of providers to do kind of coalitions around uh, improving healthcare quality and value, um, uh, which would, again, kind of indirectly as externality that improves um, affordability and for people and, and ways to, you know, kind of accelerate uh, uh, or improve the, the general coverage of the population in a kind of indirect way. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that's great. And um, Shadana, I definitely wanna get back to your question because it's interesting. It takes us in sort of a different direction, but um, Rachel, your question that you posed a few minutes ago actually also you know, dovetails nicely with what we were just talking about. Would you like to, um, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on? I guess I was uh, sort of thinking again about industry players like Google and, and, and Microsoft and Amazon who've entered into the healthcare space or, or stepped back from it, I think as Google kind of recently did, but that, that they are often, it seems like often a lot of their target is on their own employees and their own self-insured system or in supporting, and, and this is not only true for the larger players, but a lot of innovation is kind of targeted at people who already have a lot of health access, who already have a lot of tech access. As one of the other uh, uh, fellows with me said in a recent uh, meeting we had, you know, how do we avoid tech being another, tech access being another social determinant of health? So I'm, it, sometimes it feels like all of the innovation is focused on the people who already have access. So how do we challenge that? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that tech access is a uh, challenge, right? Not only if we not only in the US, but globally, right? You got 2 billion people that don't have access. So how are they going to get uh, care? I mean, the hope is that the technological advances that do accrue initially to the wealthier uh, populations uh, can get refined and cheapened enough so that they can be much more broadly distributed pretty quickly to, uh, you know, people in less fortunate situations, whether we're talking globally or, or even uh, within the U.S. I mean, that's the hope that there's some kind of a 
trickle down. And I think there's some truth to that kind of, um, it is, but it isn't fair at the beginning by any stretch of the imagination, right? There's no, there's not equity there. Um, so Microsoft actually has a few initiatives where they're trying to have access equity to um, broadband, right? And working on that, actually working on policy there, where again, we say, you know, that's, what's the health implication of that? If, if you can have uh, teleconsultation, um, tele-access to your records, tele-access to providers, that might dramatically improve uh, health access and even health outcomes, um, not only for the US, but, but uh, globally. So there's a group, uh, Vikram Dendry is working on that. Uh, Jim uh, Weinstein and I and uh, Desmond Carey are working on this health equity uh, kind of assessment for the US uh, to try to address uh, that. I, I think you're exactly right there, you know, the rich too tend to get the first crack at things. And he, indeed, you know, one, one of the challenges about US healthcare is, uh, as you, and you know, right, is that uh, while we beat up on it a lot in the US, if you're anywhere else in the world and you want the best care in the world, you fly here, right? Um, to, to certain places here, right? So you get, or, or the Cleveland Clinic is off in Abu Dhabi setting up their own clinic to provide care there, right? So, so the very rich can continue to access that. The hope is that that then kind of, there's some spillover that might occur uh, at these other places. But I totally agree with your point. And uh, we're, we're setting up a bunch of initiatives and trying to address it, uh, but, and it may be a challenge. Yeah, great, great points. Um, okay, so Rebecca, I see that you've got your hand up. I wanna make sure that we get back to Shadena's question because it's an interesting sort of alternative pathway, which is we've talked a lot about the power that purchasers have and these large employers, but what about the general public? And, and Shadena, I'd, I'd love to ask you to come off mute and maybe pose your question um, about social media because that's an interesting other way to think about this? Just what about tapping into the people themselves? Yes, so um, I guess where my mind was going is that um, with the current popularity and just impact of um, social media in general, especially during the pandemic, and you see a lot of videos for, from you know regular people or health, even healthcare providers making videos, educating others about how they can access services that they may be unaware of, and that's kind of sparking a curiosity in others and to be more aware of um, just resources or services that they can use. And just as we're doing like this round table discussion, do you think that going on Instagram Live or any type of those, um, those services would make an impact to others who probably wouldn't be aware of this information that we're learning about right now? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the social media is a is a good way to share information. Of course, the challenge is I'm, I'm actually the medical director for Bing, you know, which is our Google, uh, Microsoft's tiny Google. Um, but but there's a lot of chance for misinformation. In fact, I was on a call with the guys. Uh, they're they're uh, based in India uh, this morning, and 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 that's a kind of a question: How do you get accuracy of the data um, that's being imparted to people? Right. Uh, that's the the reference I was trying to suggest was to use actual real claims data to just talk about volumes and then suggest that volumes have this association and you could quote, you know, we could quote 20 papers that show this for these particular things um, and, and kind of promote uh, uh, patient uh, empowerment because Microsoft is all about empowering it, companies and uh, individuals to do more. So that that would be kind of consistent with our mission. How, how can we empower patients through um, and potential patients through uh, information? Um, uh, I, I, I do worry a little bit, you know, given, uh, I mean, just what I read, you, you get these very, you know, like Invernectin, right, for for COVID, I mean, this, there's this crazy stuff that happens, uh, and it's very scary because it can happen very, very quickly, and it's very dangerous. And I think you know, you have uh, providers um, or people who pretend to be providers who are promoting certain things. It's not a good deal. So to me, there's there's a little bit of a need for regulatory uh, stuff going on there. Um, but I but I think it's got huge potential. I mean, social media has huge potential for uh, good and bad. I guess is the challenge. <laughs> Yep, well said. 
Okay, Rebecca, back to you. Um, you had a, your hand up earlier. I don't know exactly what your question would have been, but please take it away. Yeah, um, so it's perfect to go after Shadina. I didn't want to be the first person to say COVID or pandemic, so I'm glad she was. Um, so, and mine is sort of like an open-ended, I don't quite know what I'm looking for here, but would just love any thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think there's two sides of the pandemic. One, um, we all probably knew that social determinants of health were a thing and something people should pay attention to. Um, I hear that in circles and places that I had never heard before, which I think is good. Um, so that's a positive. I'm an eternal optimist, so I should start with that. Um, but I, I also worry, you know, for example, in my world um, with cancer patients, um, here in Washington State, we haven't quite gotten to crisis standards of care yet. Um, but I was reading, I think either this morning or last night that Northern Idaho is doing that. And that's right over our border. And, you know, so I can see um, there being some really scary long-term impacts to the healthcare system. And I realize we're still in the pandemic, so you probably don't have any, you know, well thought out things yet on that sense. But I, I just wanted to hear any thoughts that you or anyone else had um, on things we should just be um, aware of and trying to be cognizant of that we may not already be thinking of. Yeah, I, I do think, I mean, I agree with you that the social determinants has been just highlighted that these differences and even the access we were just talking about, right, really has impacted uh, uh, or has been demonstrated as a, having a huge impact on health outcomes. I think quality of care, you know, there have been a couple of studies that have shown that in New York, it really mattered which hospital you went to, right? And, and, and minorities tended to live near the hospitals providing the poor quality care, right? Which may have explained some of the higher um, mortality rates that they were experiencing. I think, you know, tele has exploded, right? But what, um, there, there have been great papers that just show this huge increase and for shrinks, right? It's, it's actually maintained it because people, no one wants to drive in to the shrink's office and have be seen going to the shrink and now you can have stuff that's very private and even do addiction stuff from there. So that it kind of is good. I think the question is, are these, uh, are, are a bunch of the televisits, um, are they replacements or are they additions? Hopefully it's a good mix of them and hopefully we can get that right. I just think it's gonna take some time to get that that right. Um, I missed the part, what did you say Idaho is doing? Are they restricting care? Yeah, so, so they're, um, it sounds like Northern Idaho is going to crisis standards of care. So they're, yeah. um, which is- Because of the COVID. Yeah, yeah, I saw that today. Yeah. They're, they're, they called it, uh, where I read it from, it was that they're rationing it. Uh, yeah, care. which is yeah. not a great word. It's a little but, extreme, not quite yeah. right. Yeah, but I, um, I think, yeah, so how for cancer patients, you know, you know, I know there were a ton of uh, going, going ca cancer screenings were missed, right? Cancer yep. patients had difficulty getting in and, and kids were not getting vaccinated because they skipped their, their two-year-old visits, right, for a year. Yeah. Um, because, uh, so, so I think it's that this, this big health impact here again, you know, I, I worry, uh, I think the long-term mental and economic impact of being out of school for so long is not going to be good for, for the, either the kids that had that or, or the economy going forward for a while. It's going to be a tough thing. Um, but, but I, I mean, I don't know, this is, you know, it's one of the you know, to get a vaccine, I, I was I was on this COVID vaccine workforce thing at, at Microsoft, and you know, it started last April, and I was looking up the last you know the last time that they did a vaccine for uh, kind of a this type of virus, it took them six years. Oh yeah, yeah, it. it's interesting. So, yeah. yeah, we um just really quick, and I think some of you probably know this, but Fred Hutch was the coordinating center for something called the CoVPN. Um, so we coordinated all the phase, almost all of the phase three clinical trials for the COVID vaccine. Our former director um, is friends with a guy named Tony Fauci, so he knew about us. Um, but it's been very interesting doing some of the like education components on how this vaccine was created. And we recently did a roundtable with the Washington State Labor Council, um, a town hall, and and that's as some of you may know, like a more conservative. Um, white man group. Um, and it was just fascinating hearing 
their lower rate of vaccination, the misinformation that they were experiencing. Yeah. And thank gosh, you know, they had someone that they trusted to tell them the truth. Um, so totally, I, I do want to end on a good note from my question. Um, I, uh, I do see in my personal life, um, the therapist that I go see, we've started hiking. Um, we did tele visits initially, and then she lives in Issaquah. So we go on hikes for our sessions. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, I, you know, I tell everyone I can, um, that that's maybe a possibility with yours. So I, I think there are some good things to this. We just have to make sure that we, we focus on them and are intentional about it. Yeah, no, I think, I think there's, uh, just like social media, there's really good stuff that can come out and, and yeah. bad. I think, like I said, it underscored, there's this need for, uh, equity and access and equity and care. And, uh, and that's why part of the reason Microsoft is kind of really getting into that. Um, and, and just the potential, right. Cause we, people have been talking about tele forever and the potential has been realized pretty quickly. I think what, you know, talking about policy, one of the big policies about tele had to do with state licensure, right. Which was and, and payment, both of those things that go into your incentives and your barriers and your uh, in Cambia Grove's kind of pathway, um, the infrastructure and the uh, incentives. Um, and so by relieving that, it could explode. And, and one, it, I, I've been working with our um, benefits at Microsoft for a while. And you know, one potential thing that could happen is access to the type of person that you really want to see could really expand if there was kind of federal licensing, like happens in the VA system or in the military system. Yeah, um, the so example, yeah, the example was given is that you may, uh, there was a Microsoft employee who is deaf and they wanted to have a deaf therapist, not someone who could sign, but someone who actually experienced deafness so that they could have a better, they thought they would have a better thing. And that's going to be a tough person to find probably. But if, if that person is in Florida and now they're, the laws are, are liberalized so that that person can treat people anywhere, that could really make for a lot of people like this person who are seeking that, it could make that much more accessible, right? So you could, I met, Microsoft has this really intriguing uh, technology for gaming that uh, they use where if, if you're, I'm not a gamer, but uh, my kids are, and uh, if you're gaming, right, if it's, if, if you're much, much better than the other person, it's really not any fun because it's over really quickly and you kill them. And if you're much, much worse, it's no fun because it's the same thing, you just immediately get blown away. So they use these matching algorithms that make it a fun encounter and a good game, right? And one could imagine using that same kind of algorithmic approach to match providers to patients by on, on these characteristics of what will make it a good experience for them. So, you know, if you like someone who says, here's the facts, do it and that's what you like, you can probably find someone that will do that. And that would be a better match than just kind of the random way uh, that we do it. So, so liberalizing the laws, using more of that kind of matching kinds of stuff to, to get people to where they should be and who's going to improve their experience and improve the provider experience to achieve the quadruple aim. Those are all uh, great and promising things. But there's these challenges of, you know, these other spillovers, like you squeeze out the ability, if the, if the hospital's full, you know, there were that's the total excess deaths, right, is higher than the COVID deaths in part because people were having heart attacks and dying because they were too scared to go to the hospital, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Um, and actually, Rachel, you had a question that you put in the chat that I think actually ties nicely in with this. It relates to um, provider practice patterns and geographic differences in care. And so, Rachel, I'd love to call back on you um, to share your question. Yeah, just uh, you mentioned earlier, and I think you were referencing some of the Dartmouth Atlas work about how, about uh, how you know geographic location impacts uh, the care you get, and that and that over time you discovered that that was really tied to economic uh, disadvantage. But I also remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a component of sort of practice pattern too, that some of where you trained, like I remember that there was an example of Vermont, New Hampshire, and the ENTs, whether you had your tonsils, like all the kids under a certain age had their tonsils out in one state and didn't in the other. And a lot of that had to do with provider training and, uh, and practice patterns. And I'm curious, you know, the link, or if you see a link uh, between provider, from the provider side, practice patterns and that economic disadvantage, um, you know, unconscious bias, um, 
racial uh, uh, perceptions um, or or you know how much is of how you practice not just you know did per- someone get their flu shot because they live in an economic disadvantaged area and maybe access is difficult but how much of from the provider side practice patterns is different is driven or tied somehow to that economic disadvantage yeah so i think that's a really good point i think i, I haven't seen all that much done on that but there was a study that was actually done that's really intriguing that um, providers tend to like to work in more economically advantaged places right because there's more money and people are better insured and stuff like that um, uh, and so there tends to be a higher n- number of providers per capita in those areas, right? And a lower number, uh, uh, you know, per capita per capita residents in rural settings and places that are less uh, economically advantaged. And what what you see is, uh, you know, providers uh, like to keep their books full, right? They keep their schedules full. And if you have a higher number of providers per capita, you you have kind of a smaller panel. So you see those patients more often. So people getting um, just treatment for hypertension might come in for three or four visits a year, right? Whereas in a rural setting where they're the only doctor, they might just take care of the patients like once a year. And, and the, the ultimate ex- experience is, I guess, Sweden, where if, you're, if you have hypertension and they put you on a med and you've got well-controlled hypertension, they tell you to come back when you've got a problem. So maybe a couple of years before you come back. So I think I think local economic conditions and local um, uh, competition matter certainly for provider practice patterns. I mean, one of the challenges that Elliot Fisher, I don't know if you ever uh, heard him talk at Dartmouth, one, one of the really interesting things that he found is that actually more care tends to be associated with worse outcomes because there's more tinkering and there's more fooling with uh, stuff, they do more tests, they're more, you know, the more tests you do, the more false positives you do, the more stuff you have to follow up on, the more exposed uh, patients are to risk and maybe unnecessary risk. And there's kind of worse outcomes that are associated with that. So getting it right, uh, going back to the earlier question of having a uh, universal care might actually help uh, reduce some of those competitive things and get things a little more right as far as uh, appropriate utilization for the appropriate populations at the at the right times. Yeah, that that's really interesting, and and I, the the point about uh, your filling your panels, things like that, is is uh, super interesting. And I would say that in radiology, we certainly see that overutilization and the sort of finding things you weren't looking for and and follow yeah. up those kinds of things. Just a a little tie on question because you um, talk you were talking about telehealth and the ability of it to um, sort of provide access for people, you know, the right provider who might be in a different state, those kinds of things. And tying back to what you said about um, volume requirements and minimum kind of expertise, which I sort of hear as subspecialization to a certain extent, right? You need to do a certain amount of something to be really good at it. But that's, of course, challenging for things that are procedural and have to be done in person, because just like you just said, providers tend to want to be in cities. The, the, the subspecialists are all centered around academic centers or large practices in big cities. We see that in radiology. So what do you do for the critical access hospital or the small communities where you can't go to the person who does, you know, yeah. all the hip replacements? Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. And so what I mean, what you have to do is, frankly, have networks. And I don't know if you knew Dartmouth actually, you know, Dart- Dartmouth was kind of the mothership and there were about 13 hospitals more in rural Vermont and New Hampshire that fed patients into Dartmouth. And the idea was to make it, you know, the, the challenge is that academic centers will sometimes want to take everything, right? So some of the really profitable stuff actually, so hip and knee replacements can be pretty well done in the community if they just, they just have to do 40 a year. And uh, smaller hospitals, you can do that. And the orthopods will like to do that. So you don't want to steal all of their bread and butter by, by doing that. You want to keep them employed because, because as a longer term strategy, that's going to be who's feeding you these patients. So you, you bring them in for the specialist, for the super specialist, for the procedure, let them recover back at the other place, right? So that they can keep the hospital, the, that hospital becomes, you know, not near, you know, more of a community hospital or a critical access care hospital where they do the pre, uh, pre-operative workups and stuff like that and the post-op recovery stuff. 
uh, and, and you keep the academic uh, centers, you know, filled with much more complex stuff. Um, similar to how you know, it's almost the same, a similar construct of the um, where you have mid levels and physicians and and, and right, and, and you the idea is to uh, the the community hospitals can take care of the the bread and butter stuff that that doesn't require that additional super specialization that might be required for certain things so you keep them busy with that stuff and even refer some of your patients to them if it's not too far instead of having them come in and then you do the uh, specialty care and everyone wins but there's got to be kind of collaboration and, and cooperation for that to happen and not uh not competition yeah, and that gets to the question that Nina, I think, posed, which is around just the, lo the locality of healthcare and how, how it's really based in the community and every community is different. And um, Nina, is there anything else that you wanted to add to your question and to pose to build off of what we were just talking about? Oh, yeah, I wanted to know your thoughts on that. I think sometimes we think about, uh, we kind of, all of us in the healthcare innovation space, we want everything to scale, but we often lose sight of the fact that um, healthcare is, in my, in how I see it, it, it really is more most effective when it's delivered, uh, tailored and delivered to the community. Um, and I wanted to know from your point of view, uh, how you see things and do you think um, that, do you think it should be, do you think it should be local? Do you think it should be delivered on a larger scale? So I think it depends on what kind of care you're talking about. So primary care and, and this kind of uh, community hospital care can be should be local, right? Primary care should be very, very local. Uh, community hospital care, you might, if you're in a rural setting, you might have to travel a little bit of a ways. Um, su super specialty care, neurosurgery and heart surgery, uh, it, it wouldn't make sense, you know, because it's the team that actually matters, right? All the studies have shown this, the team and the hospital and the surgeons, not just one of those independently. So the academic center needs to specialize in that very expensive, very tailored, very um, sub, super specialized stuff, because that's the only way to pay for it. You can't, and if you sent a cardiac surgeon out to a local hospital um, to provide local care for the two patients that needed cardiac surgery, they would probably have really bad outcomes because the team isn't trained for it. They don't have the ECMO that they need to put the patient on. The, the anesthesiologist isn't used to that. So, so I think it depends on the level that that um, for primary and, and uh, care and basic hospital care, low, you know, community pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, stuff like that. Local care is absolutely the way to go. Um, for the specialty care, you just don't you don't have enough cases or or neurosurgeons or cardiac surgeons to do that stuff. Or, or you know, if, you, if you're doing the specialty uh, radiology interventional stuff, you, you just don't have enough of those people to go to, to, to be spread out. And, and, and they, they couldn't fund themselves. You can't put that equipment everywhere. So it just kind of, from a financial perspective, there's no way that I could see to do all of that locally. I do think you think of regions like Dartmouth Atlas, you know, <laughs> they thought of, actually thought of, primary care service areas uh, that were within hospital service areas that might be community hospitals that were, were within um, hospital referral regions. And they, and they looked at how people use care. And so those were the different kind of levels of care that, they, that are provided that, that are, and there are 306 hospital referral regions in the US and about 3,400 hospital um, service areas in the US. And they, like I said, they're, they're like uh, the Russian dolls. They just one is within another. So it's, it's as local as you can get. It's a, it's a easier problem to solve than um, like the VA problem. I used to work in the VA and they're, they're only a handful of hospitals. You know, they have 126 hospitals and only a handful of those do cardiac surgery. So there you might have to go halfway across the country to get cardiac surgery. Thank you. Um, okay, so Stephanie, you had um, a comment in here about a really interesting podcast that you listened to yesterday. And I, I think that this, I think your question is actually on topic for what we've been talking about. So I'd love to hear um, a little bit more about what you learned and then um, please feel free to pose your question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, hold on, I just need to find it because I um, want to tell you, here it is, I got it's the Forum on Workplace Inclusion from Augsburg University. 
and it was basically talking about systems of healthcare and systems of inequity. So, you know, systemized our um, systemic racism exists because of all of the structures that we have in place and how you can't start doing things for diversity and inclusion until you really understand that the system is set up for disparate care. And so then her challenge, which I think was a good one, and I, you know, I, I'm a socialist at heart, so <laughs> I'll tell you my leanings right away, um, because I've been in healthcare too long and I've seen the inequities too great. So I loved her idea about thinking like, if we don't socialize things like healthcare and, and education, because that's the other thing. So what I, one of the fascinating things that she said, she was an East Indian woman, she talked about you know, the reason that there are so many healthcare professionals here um, from India and Asia is because they have socialized education. And so then they get their, their, get their training and they come over here because we don't have a, we don't have a robust system for it. I mean, we have the education systems, but we don't have the feeder mechanisms are broken in the U.S. So, and then there, of course, capitalism does still work in some spaces and her points were high. She only said high tech, but I think finance, I wonder about the oil industry. I'm from, a, I grew up in a farm, which is already, you know, that's, that, <laughs> that's already socialized as far as I can tell. Um, anyway, so I would just be curious to hear what people think around this idea about what would you socialize? What wouldn't you, what are the pros and cons of it? And um, yeah, no, I'll just be quiet and listen to you. So is this, so I don't know, uh, I mean, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think we, I, I think the, an interesting thing, uh, you know, people will talk frequently about how much they hate the thought of socialized medicine. And, and yet right now, you know, so, so in the US, something like 60% of our healthcare dollars are, are from federal or state sources, right? Which, and, and in France, where I am now is about, 85% and and I we're socialized but US isn't I mean it's just not that different you know because because I think with with, with all, a lot of this stuff the socialization to me um, more as a, an economist is thinking about the risks that you are taking right and you can't I mean we're socialized when it comes to FEMA right when it comes to hurricane relief uh, because everyone's taxed everyone pays in only certain people get it because you, you individuals can't afford the risk individuals can't afford the risk of have bad health outcomes because they're somewhat random in nature and even if you it's not random if you smoke yourself to death you, you know no one can afford the treatment so you, just from a financial perspective you can't do it and the same with education i mean it should be with education i think they're trying to work on that right with um the, just the cost the tuition costs for uh, even the public schools have just gotten out, you know, outrageous. And these poor kids are coming out with, um, you know, a mortgage worth of debt. <laughs> and then, and which, which again, for me, if you think more long term, so how, how was it, that's, what's that going to do to the housing market? Um, it's not going to be very good when, when all these, uh, when the baby boomers like me start selling off their other houses to downsize, there's not going to be demand for them because the kids won't be able to afford it, right? Because they're they're overwhelmed with uh, so it just it's just something that you know I think the 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 financial risks just have to be mitigated in a way for things that have, have become quite expensive that include healthcare and education and and uh, probably a variety of other things. I don't know if that quite answered that. You know I think it's uh, uh, yeah it's it it becomes this you know intriguing political and divisive discussion sometimes. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would just be curious whatever else other people think, so as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it is a big discussion. I think that it is, could be divisive. I think that typically in this space, I've found that um, people are thinking a little bit more progressively, but I could be totally wrong. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think it's interesting, you know, we're like, I heard the same story this morning about crisis care in Idaho. And I've heard, you know, a lot, you know, we've heard that throughout the pandemic moments where people have to make decisions about who gets a ventilator, that kind of thing. And I find it interesting when we were first talking about Obamacare, and even when Hillary Clinton was talking about universal health care, one of the great fears was that we would have to ration 
healthcare, which is something we do already, I think, um, on a baseline level, we make all sorts of decisions that that ration healthcare, but. Um, but people were concerned about, you know, death panels that grandma wouldn't be allowed to, uh, you know, someone would decide not to continue her care towards the end of life. And here we are doing exactly that. By the same token, we're also providing a socialized care. We're providing free COVID testing, free vaccines. Uh, originally, I don't know if this is still the case, treatment for COVID was considered covered. So in fact, it's something really that people want, I think. Um, even those who think they don't want it, who are who are scared of uh, the idea of it because of its label as being socialized. Yeah, I think I think it is the label, right? That ter- they say I, I don't want this, and then they don't understand. You know, it's, it's like uh, I'll date myself, but Mitt Romney uh, gave gave this talk, you know, and, and people said I, I get that it was a bunch of Medicare, you know, 65 and older people. And they said they want the government's hands out of their health insurance. It's like the government is your health insurance. You don't, they don't get, so it's this misinformation campaign that, that they don't, I don't want socialized medicine, but I love my Medicare. It's like, but that, that is socialized medicine. So they, I think is a, you know, they get scared of the, the and, and the, the deaf panel stuff was just absurd. And yeah, it's crazy. Well, this is a topic that we could go on and on about, I'm sure, for hours, and it's fascinating, um, and I'm glad it was posed. It's it's really interesting. So we're about ready to wrap in just a few minutes here. Laura mentioned in the chat that she'll be launching a poll asking for feedback about today's discussion. So I'll just warn you that that's coming probably right about now, um, and then it'll pop up on your screen, so please feel free to click through, um, share your feedback. And then we might have time for just one or two more questions before we drop, probably just one more question. Or um, Dr. Weeks, if you had any you know, parting thoughts that you wanted to share, um, we could go either way with that. Does anyone have any, any final questions or final comments that they'd like to share before we drop today? Okay, then I guess Dr. Weeks, I'll, I'll kick it back to you if you have any, maybe maybe how we can frame this is any final words of advice you have for us. Um, yeah, we're advice. all here I, trying to trying to change the healthcare system and improve yeah. it and improve outcomes. How, what are, what are your parting words of advice for us? Well, I'm just encouraged that, that there's this interested and educated group of people who are willing to spend some time and talk on the subject and be intrigued by it and, and you know, uh, push some of the ideas uh, forward. So it's really just kind of uh, delightful for me to see that that's the case, that people are interested, that they're in healthcare and they see these opportunities. Um, I, I guess the, my advice, just given what the talk was and everything, is to think about, you know, if there's this idea of, uh, of an investment, um, uh, whether it's from within a healthcare system or outside, think of the even the health uh, impact of of the investment on society, right? And, and thinking about how to capture that and articulate that. Because again, I, I think uh, the more that that is kind of made transparent and made clear, uh, the more of, more people would say, well, this, oh, this is good for society. This is good for the population's health. And so barriers to doing that might kind of drop uh, by the wayside a bit. So thanks for the opportunity to chat with you guys. It's been really fun. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I, I'd welcome you guys. I don't know if you have my email address, but you're welcome to shoot me an email. If, uh, uh you guys, I, is it on somewhere? I'm sure someone's got I, it. I did not share it with everyone, but we can oh. pop it into the chat here. Yeah. You want me to do that? Sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. And yeah, if thank anyone you. Has questions, uh, that I'd be happy to chat with people. Uh, on just on this topic. That'd be great. Yeah, we appreciate that. And we appreciate your time um, so much. This has been really, really fun. And thanks to everybody else for your great questions and contributions. Um, a couple of just closing comments before we drop is um, we, we just invite all of you to stay connected with Cambia Grove. If you're not already, um, we invite you to sign up as a member. Um, to join Cambia Grove's membership. It's free throughout at least the rest of this year. 
and provides you access to a great connected um, community of change makers. And then also please do take a look at our calendar um, and see if there are any upcoming events or opportunities that interest you. We'd love to invite you to participate in other conversations of this sort or um, other topics. We've got a lot of really exciting, fun stuff coming up. Um, so please find us online, join the membership, check out our calendar, and we hope to see you again very soon. And thank you again, Dr. Weeks. We much appreciate Anytime. you calling in. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.